It's really good to be able to gather this morning on this wonderful Easter Sunday. Some of you made it down to the castle with me earlier at 7 o'clock this morning, so some of us have already started our Easter, um, Easter celebrations, and that was it. it was good to gather with other churches this morning, and it's good to be able to gather here also. Uh, and if you're at home joining us online, that's great too. A um, couple of uh, notices before we start, before we truly get into our worship. A big, big thank you to those of you who uh, have been involved in decorating our church window sills out the front and this one here as well. Um, it just brings sort of spring into the building and new life, doesn't it? Helps us remember um, Jesus and all that he brings us. So thank you for that. And um, if you know of anyone who would appreciate a bunch of daffodils, uh, who's not perhaps been able to make it here this morning, do speak to Jill after the service. Um, she's going to coordinate the giving out of things that may be, uh, can become gifts to others later. Um, uh, a quick personal message. I forgot to put it in the notices. Um, I'm not going to be around this week. I'm on holiday with my family, um, but I will be back a week on Monday. And the final one. We've got lots of hot cross buns. Uh, still left over. You did a brilliant job bringing hot cross buns for our for our Good Friday um, sort of uh, gathering here. And we got so many that we're now able to. We've overspilt our our um, opportunities to eat hot hot cross buns, and we've got many for after the service. Um, so do please come down into the lower hall and share tea, coffee, and hot cross buns. Oh, and chocolate Easter eggs too. Um, so. Let's um, share in some words as we come together in worship this morning. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Darkness has been vanquished. The brilliant light of hope has come. Come, let us worship and celebrate the good news. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Amen. Please, can, uh, please stand if you'd like to as we sing Thine Be the Glory.
you take your seats. We're going to pray and then we're going to uh, watch a version of the Easter story. Loving God, we thank you for today, the best day of the year. Because on this Easter day, we celebrate that Jesus, who was dead, is alive again. And we remember his promise that all who believe and put their trust in him shall have eternal life. New life with you and a hope for the future. On this day of celebration, help us to truly grasp the significance of these events. Thank you that Jesus came, died and rose again for us and for the whole world. Amen. Let's watch this together. The Easter story begins on Palm Sunday. Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey. The crowds shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They waved palm branches and laid their cloaks on the ground. A few days later, Jesus and his disciples were sharing the Passover meal. Jesus predicted that one of them would betray him, and his disciples were shocked and saddened. Jesus broke the bread and said, This is my body, broken for you. Then he took the wine and said, This is my blood of the covenant, poured out for many. Jesus said to Peter, before the cock will crow this very night, you will disown me three times. But Peter insisted, I am willing to die with you, Jesus. I will never disown you. Jesus and his disciples went out to the garden of Gethsemane. Jesus asked his disciples to keep watch while he prayed. Abba, Father, he said, Everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Then Judas came to betray Jesus to the Jewish leaders. Jesus was arrested and the disciples ran away. The Jewish leaders put Jesus on trial before the high priest. Even though Jesus was innocent, he didn't defend himself from the false accusations made against him. When the high priest asked Jesus, Are you the Messiah? Jesus answered, I am. Then the high priest condemned Jesus to death and beat him. While Jesus was on trial, Peter was in the courtyard below. Three times people asked Peter if he knew Jesus, but three times Peter denied knowing him. Then the cock who crowed, and Peter remembered what Jesus had said. And he wept. Jesus was then taken to Pilate, the Roman governor. Pilate knew Jesus was innocent, but the crowd shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! And Pilate was afraid. So Pilate let Barabbas, a murderer, go free instead of Jesus. They dressed Jesus in a purple robe and a crown of thorns. Jesus was crucified on Good Friday with a thief by the side of him. At 12 o'clock, in the middle of the day, darkness came over the whole land for three hours. Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then he breathed his last. When the Roman centurion saw how Jesus died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. After Jesus died, his body was placed in a tomb. And a heavy stone was rolled across the entrance. When the Sabbath was over, Mary and the women came early on Sunday morning to anoint Jesus' body according to the Jewish custom. But when they got there, the stone had been rolled away. And the tomb was empty. An angel told them the good news. Jesus is not here. He has risen from the dead.
Jesus is not here. He has risen from the dead. And that is why we celebrate him today. And I invite you to stand again as we sing Jesus Christ is risen. Scrunch beneath my feet, shattering into hundreds of pieces as I slowly drag myself up the hill, longing for the comfort of my own home, a place of safety and familiarity in the midst of all the confusion of the last few days. I look down at the massive branches. How is it even possible? Just a week previous, these leaves were lush and green, standing tall and proud as they were waved in celebration. The sun is peeking its head over the stone walls, and I start to feel the warmth on my already flushed cheeks. My skin feels tight and sticky from the dry, salty tears that cling there. Dried leaf fragments twirl and dance in the early morning wind, swept along with no clear path or purpose, reminding me of myself before I met him. No one has ever had such a profound impact on my life. So when they took his body off the cross and they declared him dead, my whole world ended. The one who brought such life, light into my life was gone and I felt scared to go back to the darkness. I saw the way he loved people. 
I experienced it myself. A love so deep and so pure. Everyone should have the opportunity to feel that love, that complete acceptance. But it wasn't just that. The way he challenged what needed to be challenged made me want to stand up to the people and fight. Fight for the vulnerable and the scared and the outcast. As I climb steps to my door, my body starts to feel the exhaustion. I sit on the top step, where I've sat many times before, and I try to remember every detail of the previous few days. Saturday is a blur. I spent it with the others. Not much was said, but it was felt. We all felt it, the shock, the grief, but also that love. That love which now holds us all together. But there was hope. He said he would come back. He alluded to the fact that this wasn't the end. But it all felt so impossible. We'd seen him die. We'd all watched him take his last breath. I'm shaking, overwhelmed by the impact of the grief and the fear, which in the last few hours has just transformed into joy, peace, hope, and disbelief. So I take a deep breath. I lift my eyes and my head. Today is a new day. This morning, I saw him again. I felt his breath on my skin. I saw his feet walk and his voice whisper, my Lord, my God, my friend, my brother, there, standing in front of me, his body restored. Life filling it more fully and more vibrantly than it had ever done. Then, peace fills me. The shaking stops and I get to my feet. I look out on the streets surrounding my home, watching members of my community just starting to go about their daily business. They have no idea what's just happened, how the whole world has changed. Today's Bible reading comes from Luke, chapter, starting in chapter 23 and verse 50, which is on page 1060. Now, there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man, who had not consented to their decision and action. He came from the Judean town of Arimathea, and he himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. Then he took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and placed it in a tomb cut in the rock, one in which no one had yet been laid. It was preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph, and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. Then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes, but they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, 
But when they entered, they, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why don't you look for the living among the dead? He's not here, he has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over, over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. And they remembered his words. There are four accounts in the Bible of the events surrounding Jesus' death and resurrection. The Lego story that we heard earlier uh, is one where there's one angel. Uh, the monologue that I've just done of Mary comes from a second version and Fliss has just read us the version from the book of Luke. So you will see sometimes uh, one angel, sometimes two, and different different things all um, sort of make up a, a rounded um, version of the story. But I wonder, have you ever ex experienced something totally unexpected? So totally unexpected that you don't quite know how to deal with what's just happened? Perhaps it was something terrible. Perhaps it was something joyful. The woman who went to Jesus' tomb had been, had been on an emotional roller coaster. Only a short time earlier, Jesus had ridden into Jerusalem on a donkey with people praising and celebrating. And now, their teacher, their healer, their friend, the one who saw them and loved them was gone. The one they hoped was the Messiah was dead. The women had bought spices to anoint the body of Jesus. So they were puzzled when they didn't find Jesus' body as they expected. They knew they were in the right place. They'd been there just before the Sabbath, having followed Joseph of Arimathea and seeing the tomb and how his body was laid in. And they, they were now returning to pay their respects. But the stone that had sealed the tomb was not across the entrance. And in the place they were expecting to find Jesus, there were two men in dazzling clothes. We interpret them as angels or messengers from God. Now, Jewish law required that there, were there would be two witnesses to confirm something that was claimed to be true. So maybe this is why, in Luke's version of the story, we have God sending two messengers, and not just one, perhaps. The encounter was a frightening experience for the women. And unlike when the angel appears at other times, or angels appear at other times in the Gospels, here the women are not reassured with a, don't be afraid. I wonder if you remember that from Jesus' birth. Don't be afraid, Mary. Don't be afraid, Joseph. They don't get that here. Instead, the angels challenge the women with the central question of the story. Why do you look for the living among the dead? A strange question indeed. The women had come to anoint a body. They were not looking for someone who they thought was alive, someone who'd been resurrected. They'd seen what had happened to Jesus. But when the angel challenged them, and reminded them of Jesus' words, 
the jigsaw pieces of the past conversations and recent events began to fall into place. And the women hurried back to the disciples to share the amazingly good <laughs> news. The women remember. And once they're with the disciples, they repeat what they've been told by the two angels. He has risen. Jesus is not dead. He has risen. <laughs> this is how faith grows in us. We remember what Jesus has said and done for us. And we repeat the same message over and over. He's not dead. He has risen. We're witnesses to each other, remembering, repeating what we've experienced in our lives and how Jesus has been at work in us. He's not dead. He's at risen. He's at work in my life. He can be at work in yours. We're told that the women were not believed when they shared what they discovered. This was despite there being more than two of them to make their witness valid. What they were saying didn't fit with the people's expectations. No one, none of the disciples were looking for resurrection. Jesus, their friend and teacher, had been brutally killed and his body was placed in a tomb. Fact. Jesus was gone. Returning from that was surely an impossibility, wasn't it? Although Peter wasn't ready to believe what the women were saying, I find it quite interesting that he was willing to check it out. It's like, oh, maybe. So he runs to the tomb and he looks inside. And what he sees is a pile of grave clothes. The linen fabric that, according to John's account of these events, was covered in myrrh and aloes. The thing about myrrh, that some of you might know, is that it's actually pretty sticky. Okay? It's made from tree resin. I don't know if you've ever been under a tree and it drops that sticky sap sometimes, or you've parked your car under it and it's covered up. Yeah? Imagine that all over the linen clothes. Okay? It sort of acted like glue sealing the burial clothes to the body and stopping all the stench and smells from escaping. Okay. Yet when Peter looks in, he sees the linen cloths by themselves. This is quite significant. Because if someone had stolen the body, they would not have bothered to unwrap it first. They would have taken it all wrapped up and sealed as it was. The tomb isn't empty because someone stole the body. The tomb is empty because Jesus had risen from the dead and was alive. The women heard evidence from two witnesses that Jesus was alive. Peter sees the evidence that it's not just a case of a stolen body. The linen cloths are lying there in a heap because they're no longer needed. Peter goes away, amazed, but also a bit unsure about what's going on. He's still not quite ready to believe what he sees. He's not looking for the resurrection quite yet. But all the evidence is there. How about you? Are you ready to believe that Jesus didn't stay dead but was raised to life again? Or are you like Peter? Not yet quite convinced, but interested to see what happens. Perhaps you're here this morning willing to accept the possibility that the resurrection story is true. But you admit that it hasn't impacted you in any significantly meaningful way. It's just a nice story to you. It hasn't really changed your life. Or maybe you're more like my friend, Chris. 
Chris was someone whose life was completely devoted to the truth of this story. Um, Chris died suddenly a couple of years ago over the Easter weekend. Um, but whilst she was alive, her whole life reflected her belief that Jesus did not stay dead, but that God raised him back to life again. Chris was uh, filled with such a faith in the living Lord Jesus that she lived this out every day. Everywhere she went, she listened to people and told them about Jesus. She spent years and years and years telling the teenagers in the local park how much Jesus loved them and praying for them. She was known as the lady, um, as, as the Jesus lady, and, and the one who gave out Jesus loves you stickers. Generations of people in the town where she lived were impacted by her actions, which were born out of her love and her devotion to Jesus. Chris wanted everyone that she met to know and to love Jesus. She wanted them to experience the hope that she had and the abundant life that, God's gift, that, that is God's gift through Jesus to us. You could see it in her smile. It was always on her face. You could hear it in the way she thought the best of people and she gave them the benefit of the doubt. Many, many second chances. You could tell by spending even just a few minutes with Chris that this was a lady who knew what it meant to live in hope, even when life wasn't easy. She was still full of joy and could always find something to be thankful for. Today, we remember all that Jesus' life and death and resurrection means for us and for this broken and hurting world. Today, on this Easter Sunday, we celebrate that Jesus is not dead. He is risen and he is present among us. And whatever is going on for us and however difficult things are, for some of us. We do have this to be thankful for. Jesus died for you and for me and was raised to life again so that we can be friends with God. What amazing What an amazing, loving God we have. That he didn't want us to stay separate from him, but wanted us in, to be in relationship with him. Hopefully, you received a tulip on your way in this morning. These were made by some of the people at Meet and Make this week. Um, we've got flowers around the building. We've got some tulips on our cross already. If you haven't got one, there's a, um, we'll bring the basket in and then we can uh, hand some out. And then uh, we've, got, we've got some more pens. I would love this morning for you to spend a few moments perhaps reflecting on what we've shared already this morning and writing somewhere on your tulip things that you are thankful for today. It could be as simple as Jesus. You just write that on your tulip. That's or it could be even more. You could cover it in words. Whatever would be helpful for you this morning. And then a few of us will, um, if you want to bring them up yourself, you're welcome to. Otherwise, a few of us will um, collect them from you and we will put them on the cross so we cover our cross with thanks okay. and uh, um, I think we're going to have some music whilst we're doing that so, so let's spend a few minutes thanking God <coughs> for 
has much to be thankful to God for on this Easter Sunday. Can I invite you to please stand as we sing, See What a Morning. sessions this morning are very general, but they'll bring specific people, places and situations to our minds to lift up silently as we go through. So let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, eternal and unchanging, God of compassion, of glory, grace, salvation, and joy. As we've meditated this Easter week on the pain borne by Jesus, the trauma he lived, the shame he endured, we bring to your feet, conquering Lord, the suffering of the world today. We think of those like Jesus, falsely accused and punished. Those let down or betrayed by others close to them. The rejected, isolated, forsaken, and all who are belittled, ridiculed, or humiliated. We bring, Lord, those, Lord, troubled and overwhelmed with sorrow, as Jesus was at Gethsemane. Those who dread what they know or fear may lie ahead of them. Those in agony of body, mind or spirit, 
and countless numbers experiencing or living with the consequences of violence and brutality. We meditate, Lord, on all these situations known by you in Jesus and ask you to hold your suffering children, walk beside them, bring them your comfort, relief and knowledge of your victory, eternal life and joy. As we have meditated on the actions of Pilate and those in authority when Jesus died, we pray for leaders and those in authority across the world today to turn to you for wisdom and guidance, to seek justice, equality and the best of welfare for all your creation. God of tenderness and care, as we have remembered the loving actions of Joseph of Arimathea in laying your body to rest, and of the women coming with spices and perfumes to anoint, we think of all who work in caring professions or in their own homes among family to tend, in short and long term, sickness or disability of body or mind and to those whose lives are drawing to a close. We give thanks for selfless devotion given in physical care, social care, spiritual, pastoral and restorative care, as well as in disaster and emergency situations and pray that you will work in and through those giving of themselves in this way to bring your healing, comfort and peace to those they tend and to receive rest, strength and encouragement themselves. We also pray for enlightenment, breakthrough and facility for all working in the field of medical research or seeking to establish measures of prevention. As we have meditated on Peter's failure and bitter weeping in denying knowing Jesus, and of Judas, so seized by the remorse of his betrayal as to take his own life, we pray for those today unable to deal with failure or perceive failure in their lives or who feel worthless or suicidal for any reason and ask for them to know the power and strength of your grace and forgiveness, the understanding of continued love and acceptance and the best support for their renewal. As we've meditated on the heart of your mother, Lord Jesus, of your family, your disciples and all who loved you, torn with grief as they stood at the cross. We bring so many broken with grief today and all who carry loss in their hearts, asking your provision for them, just as Jesus made for his own mother on that day. We have meditated on the unbelief of your disciples and followers when told of your resurrection and on those who did not recognise you as you walked with them on the road but whose eyes were opened as he broke bread and gave thanks. We pray for the many today who do not recognise you in their daily lives and for those who want to believe but find themselves unable. May your Holy Spirit be powerfully at work in the world and through us and your followers everywhere to open eyes as you prompt us in word and action. We pray for those we dearly love and walk with every day to see you clearly and believe, to accept your salvation for themselves and filled with the eternal joy known at your resurrection. 
Then to seek to walk in Jesus' way, honouring your name and bringing nearer the time when your will is done on earth as it is in heaven. We meditate on you, Lord. Come, meet us in our fears. Touch us with your wings of love and lift our hearts of tears. For you have beaten death and you have covered everything with gentle, loving breath. And so we celebrate with joy this Easter day in the knowledge of your resurrection, giving heartfelt thanks for all you have done, are doing, and will continue to do in our lives and in the world. In Jesus' name we bring these prayers. I invite you to stand for our final hymn, Crown Him with Many Crowns.
somebody else. My challenge to you is, you want no chocolate ends left in this room by the end of the day. Okay? So if you see them, gather them up. Get someone else to gather them up. Share them out. Give them away. Let's celebrate.